see, it does go round. I had a couple people comment after part two that they couldn't see the gear turn on the Telecron gear drive assembly. And I wanted to show them that, see, it does go round. Watch the blue tape. All right, let's get on with part three. In part one, you saw me disassemble the clock from the chime cover and take it all apart and talk about the different parts. In part two, we serviced the Telecron motor and gear drive assembly, so it works again, and we fixed the broken contact on it and put heat shrink tubing on the coil and reinforced it all, so it should be good for another 80 years, don't you think? In part three, and yes, I know, this is going to be more than more parts than I thought, but that's just the way it goes sometimes. In part three now, we're going to reassemble the clock assembly and put it back on the cover. So here are all of our parts. Everything has been cleaned, and as you'll be able to see, all of the brass gears are clean and shiny. There's no more grunge on them. All of the screws have been ultrasonically cleaned. The brass standoffs are cleaned. The backing plate has been cleaned and polished up so it looks nice. Even though you don't see it much, it still counts. Our base assembly for the clock mechanism has all been thoroughly cleaned. The steel and the brass parts. I have cleaned up the rod some. I'm not 100% done with that. I have to get some more 3000 grit sandpaper because I'm running a little low. So we'll do that pretty soon. Let's go ahead and reassemble all this. Let's see if we can get it back together and make it work again. And I am going to do my very best to try to keep my big old hands out of the way so you can actually see how this goes back together. We have our base assembly here and this is our first gear that goes in. And this one sort of slips down under that one and sits there. And then this gear goes on, no, this gear goes next. Now, one of the interesting things on this gear is there's three gears. You have the big gear in the center. You have a little brass gear here. And on this side, we have a little steel gear. That's why it's silver. And the reason that's a steel gear is because on this shaft, this shaft does a couple different things. This moves, you can pull it down. And it moves the lever to reset the flag. And I'll show you that when we get to that part. On the end of this shaft, there's another steel gear right here. That's why that one's silver. And when you go to set the clock, you have to pull down on the knob that's connected to the shaft. And then that engages this steel gear into that steel gear. And then you turn it, and that's how you set the time. So that, since that's a steel gear, this has to be a steel gear also, because if this were a brass gear, I'm pretty sure that the steel, which is harder than the brass, would wear out the brass gear too soon. So this one goes here. And, oh, no, that's wrong. And this one goes there. But we have to do one other thing. I just remembered. <clears throat> we have to put a little oil on it. So what is this? This is precision instrument oil. This is made by the Deoxit company. This is the same company that makes the cleaners that we use on intercom system switches and stuff like this. This is model X10X precision instrument oil. And this is something that we have here for other uses. And I was told by my friend Marv that this will work just fine. And he said, all you really want to do is put one small drop. And this has a little metal tube applicator. So you have to squeeze it really hard to get it to come out. And he said that was good because then you won't put too much. Okay, that one sits there. We'll put one little bit here. And this one sits there. So this gear, the large one here, meshes with the little gear on the one that you can't remove. And then this center gear meshes with the large outside gear here. And then this one sits on there. So we'll put a little bit of oil there like that. And this one sits there and meshes onto the little gear here. And according to Marv, the clock guy, that's enough oil on this to last, oh, he said easily 
25 years. You don't really need more than that. It depends on how dusty an environment it's actually in. Now we have to put the little flag back on. And yes, I did review the video where we took all this apart because if you remember when I was flipping it over back and forth trying to figure out how to take this gear off, it fell off and we have to get the orientation right. And that's how it sits. Now we have to put the backing plate back on like this and the bushing goes out. And what we have to do is we have to line it up correctly. So it has this indention on the back and the indention allows the flag to flip back and forth. So that's how you know where the top is. So what you do is you carefully slide this over that. But since that's a point where it turns, I suppose we should put a little bit of oil on that also. This, of course, would be somewhat easier if I had it in front of me. Now, there's th the three screws here, here, and here that hold it together. And what I'm going to do is, I'm going to start the bottom two because I have to line up the pivot pin on the flag so it comes through the hole there. And it'll be easier to do that if I can tip it up and look. So if I put these two in and just lightly tighten them down, And I, I'm going to pick it up. You don't get to see this part. You just have to take my word for it. Because I have to peer at it so I can see it. And try to move it into place. Like that. See? That was easy. It's easy if you can see it. Now I can put the third screw in. I don't think these need to be overly tight. You just sort of snug them down like that. And that should be good enough. And you can see the red flag. And if you pull down on the rod, the flag goes back to gold. But as soon as you let go, red pops back because it's not running. There's no power and that's what it's supposed to do, at least as far as I know. The last thing we'll do is we need to put the motor back in place. So let me go ahead and do that. Turn the power off to the motor because we don't want any sparks. So there's the motor and we'll take our blue flag off. See, it was running. I told everybody it was. You got to believe me on this stuff. So we'll turn this over and the motor goes this way. And the gear on the motor goes in the little hole right here. And I want to check one thing really quick. I want to make sure the nuts that hold the frame together are nice and tight. Just because. So again, I'm going to tip it up and I've got to peer at it to get it to line up correctly. And it sort of snaps in place like that. It's always more difficult to do when you're making a video than if you're not, but that's all right. Now, we need to put the brass standoffs in here. And they're held in with these long machine screws. The brass standoffs have been cleaned in the ultrasonic cleaner, as have 
the screws and this design is not unique only to this chime a lot of new tone clocks are assembled like this and this part is always a little tricky to get it all to line up it's one of those kind of things that you have to fuss around with and then suddenly it all sort of goes snap and it all goes in place and the world is good there's one and there's two And again, I don't think you need to tighten these down a lot. They just need to be snug. They do have washers to help prevent them from working loose. We'll use a slightly bigger screwdriver on these. Like that. All right, so I think that's right. So what I'm going to try to do here, see if we can prop this up a little bit. I'm going to try to set it up. I want to make sure it runs before we go any further. And what I'm going to try to do is focus in on the gears down in here for you so you can see that they actually turn. So I'm going to hook up the clip leads to the coil. And get a flashlight and turn it on. Hopefully there's no sparks. Nope. And if I look, we have gears turning. So let me see if I can focus in on that so maybe you can see gears turning also. Okay, so this is the best shot I can give you. We're looking down inside and if you look this is hard to do. If you look right down in here, you can't see that at all. Let's try a smaller one. Let's try it from this side. If you follow the screwdriver, you look right here, right there, carefully, and concentrate on it, you can see the gear turn. See, I told you it worked. Ha! Okay, let's go back and finish putting this together. So the next step is we have to put the dial back on, which just sits on here like this. And now, and see there's a little, there's a little tab right here on the backing plate that's bent up, and there's a little notch right here and that's what aligns it and holds it in place, which makes my life a little easier. Now we have to put the hands back on. Now I didn't do anything with the hands other than put them away. Because I didn't want to do anything that might damage them. So that just presses on like that and then that's the hour hand now we we'll do the minute hand and that just presses on and now we'll do the second hand And that just presses on. Now, one of the things you have to make sure, and I'm temporarily going to put the little knurled knob back on the shaft, is when you do clocks and you 
mess with the hands, you have to make sure that when the hands go around, oh look, the hands move. When they go around, they don't hit each other. And this one seems all right, because that does happen sometimes. I'm sure for anybody who does clocks all the time, they know all that stuff. All right, now we'll put our glass. Now the last time we saw the glass, it was looking pretty shabby and there was all that crud on the inside. So I did exactly what I said, which was I sprayed it with Windex on the inside. I used a bunch of paper towels, fold them up, put them in there. So they soaked up a lot of the Windex, sprayed the paper towels more, wrapped it up in a cloth and let it sit overnight. And the next morning when I got here, took out all the soggy paper towels and all the crud just wiped out and it was clean. So that worked out really well. So the glass sits on here like this. And then we have our bezel. And if you remember the bezel, it was all tarnished and I polished it with Brasso. And I have to say, it cleaned up really nicely. And I'm not sure whether it's brass or whether it's, I don't think it's copper, but maybe it, it has sort of a coppery, goldy kind of look to it. It doesn't really look like brass. Maybe it's brass and just because it's so old, the color has changed some or something. I'm not sure about that. But any way you look at it, it seems like it turned out pretty well. So if you remember, this sits on here like this. And we have to line it up because there were the two tabs that get bent over on the back side. And they were across from each other. I want to put this on a cloth. Bend that over. Bend that over. I think that's right. All right. And there's our reassembled clock. And now we have to get the cover. Now, I cleaned the inside of the cover. You remember it was all dirty. And it's probably hard to tell in the video but it's still, it's clean, it's not all grungy inside and everything, but it's old. And the other thing which I find a little disappointing, but I don't know what to do about exactly, is the outside cover, all I did was wash it with some warm soap and water and a rag, because we don't want to damage the finish. It's got this weird, crinkly, textured paint finish on it, and honestly, after all the other work that we're going to do on this, the finish on this is going to let down the way it looks. It's old, it's stained, it's really dirty. The little crinkly finish holds all the grime and doesn't really want to come out. I tried lots of different things on the top here, which is probably the worst. One that's got paint on it here. And because a lot of times these are in kitchens, and in the old days when you would paint a kitchen, you would paint it with oil-based paint, which doesn't come off very well. So it's got paint on it here that doesn't want to come off. And it's got all this, it's all soiled here. I took a rag, a shop rag, and I wetted it pretty wet and I folded it over and left it on it overnight to see if that would soften it up and then some of it would come out that didn't really help any so I don't know what to do with the cover I think for this to be really outstanding this needs to be redone but it's not something I can do or at least not today so that's for the next person or some other time so now we have to put this back in oh one other thing so originally this is the hole where the cord goes through and when we took it all apart it had this red grommet on it. I'm pretty sure red grommets are not standard. It didn't come with a red grommet, why would it? And also this is a, pretty sure this is a synthetic or plastic grommet, which they wouldn't have had in those days. So I'm gonna use a black grommet. This is the same type of grommet that we use on Newtone eight note K model chimes. And it would sort of make sense that they would use a grommet that they already had in stock and not have a special grommet for this. At least that's the way I see it. So now we have to put this back together. So this goes like this. And we have to sort of fish it in place. And if you recall when we took it out, 
it was a little tricky to do. Oh, but when we took it out, we had the motor off, didn't we? When we took it apart, we took the motor off first. So that means I have to take the motor off again. Hmm, okay, so you already saw me do that once. So I'm gonna stop this, take the motor off, and then we're gonna put it back on after. Hold on a second. All right, the motor's out. Now we can take this and put this back together like this. And we have to slide the tabs on the bezel into the slots in the cover. Just like somebody did at the factory in the 30s. All right, so what I'm gonna do is, for right now, I'm only gonna bend over two of these just to hold it in place. Because as we talked about before, all the bending and unbending, not such a great idea. So, there's our clock remounted in the cover. Now we're gonna have to put the motor back on again. So we'll put that one there and this one here. And you might notice that this is the second time we'll have been have done this. Uh, you can't put those first. Thought I was going to be super clever and slide those in there first, but it didn't work that way. Screws. Tighten those back up. Now, that's all back like it should be. We'll put our little knurled knob back on. This, surprisingly enough, is one of the trickier things to put on for some reason. It's really small, and it's really hard to hold on to. There we go. Alright, and if we pull it down, we can set the clock. It's kind of interesting, when you pull it down to set the clock, it doesn't move down very far. It only pulls out just a little bit and if you got big fingers it's a little hard to do so I don't know that's the way they made it in those days maybe people had smaller fingers in those days all right so what's the next thing we have to do well the next thing we have to do is we have to put a cord on it because you have to be able to plug it in so it actually works if you remember originally it had this piece of junk attached to it it's obviously a modern cord because it's got a safety label on it because you know you might kill yourself with it somehow or strangle yourself or hurt your dog or some other bad thing could happen and we're not putting this back on because that's just awful so what are we going to do for a cord well we're going to do this check this out this is a modern vintage looking power cord and I ordered this from a company online. Let's give them a shout out. This came from Vintage Wire Supply Company at vintagewireandsupply.com. Here, everybody look. They even sent a nice thank you note from Sharon. 
Thanks, Sharon. I appreciate it. So they have all kinds of vintage wiring cords and cables and things. And I figured that this would be something that would be sort of appropriate for something in a house from, say, 1939 or something like that. And it's a, it's a twisted cloth covered cable cord. Inside are modern electrical wires with plastic or vinyl insulation on them, which makes it really, really safe. But it's got this cool vintage -y look to it. And they have lots of different colors and things that you can pick from. I picked this one because it's sort of the black and white zebra kind of look. And it seemed to me that that would be sort of a one size fits all sort of combination that you could put in almost any house. It also has this really nice vintage style plug on the end of it. Because in 1939, that's pretty much what it would look like. It is a non-polarized plug, which means you can plug it into the wall outlet either way, either this way or this way. But on something like this, it doesn't really make any difference. So what we're gonna do is, we're gonna put this through here, through the grommet, like this. And it's a nice fit. It fits in there really well. And that's good, it's not real sloppy. And then what we have to do is we have to solder it onto the terminals on the coil, sort of like it was before, only done better. But before we do that, what we need to do is we need to make a strain relief here because, you know, if Johnny comes in with his buddies and they've been outside roller skating with their brand new clip-on roller skates that they put over their street shoes and one of them grabs the cords and pulls on it, we don't want to rip the terminal off the coil because that's probably how it got broken in the first place. So we're going to do an old school sort of strain relief. We'll pull more of this through. We'll hold our finger there so we sort of know how long it's supposed to be. And we're going to go with the old school traditional tie a knot in it because that makes a good, strong strain relief. That's never gonna pull through, and you're never gonna pull the grommet out with all of that, so that's fine. And now we have plenty of wire, and we'll wrap it around sort of like this. Uh, if I was designing this, I probably would take a wire tie or something and maybe tie it to the frame of the motor there and then loop it around so it's not just dangling, because also you don't want it to interfere with the door chime when it's working. So what we're going to do is we're going to cut back some of the cloth cover. We'll unwrap this a little bit. Actually we probably don't need to cut it back. All we need to do is push it down a little bit and we'll cut off a little of the insulation. Like this. And this is a nice stranded copper wire which is what you want on a power cord. And then once you, once you strip back the insulation, you should twist the strands together. You make a little 90 degree bend on each one. And we need our little needle nose pliers. There they are. And we'll fish one up through one terminal. Doesn't matter which one you put where. So we'll put this one here. And what I like to do is solder them right now. I like to solder the first one first. There's one, and now we'll do the white one. We'll bend that over so it makes a good connection. That's all there is to it. 
cord is attached. Now, we should do something about this. I don't really like this flopping around like this. I really want to hold it to that in some way. So the best way to do that, if you think about the old school way that you might do that, is you would use a piece of little bit of solid gauge wire. Let me get a piece. I've got a little piece of black solid gauge wire. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap it around and put it through the frame. Put the wire up against the side of the frame and twist it. Because I'm pretty sure they didn't have plastic wire ties in 1939 and you don't really want to do anything here that would make this you know modern looking. You don't want to spoil the look of it. Now some of the fringe from the cover it's kind of frayed a little bit here on the end, so we'll just sort of snip a little of that off. And probably what I'll do when I'm all done, all done with the whole chime, is what you can do with a little bit of frayed cover is you can sort of even it all out so it's all nice and straight and everything. And then use a little bit of your super glue and just put a little super glue. It'll soak into the cloth and then it'll get hard and it'll stay just like that. So now we have a proper cover. One of the things I find interesting about this kind of design is, you know, if you're going to have a doorbell with a clock, it's going to be fairly high up on the wall. It's going to be at least six feet or so. And the whole idea of having a power cord dangling down the wall six feet and then plug in a wall plug, that's a really unusual idea. I don't know that that would never fly today. I don't think it would even be considered safe, but I suppose in those days it was probably okay. So now what we need to do is we need to set the clock. So we're gonna plug it in. Hopefully there's no sparks. Nope. Oh look, the second hand is turning. You'll get to see that up close. Now you'll notice that the power off flag, let's uh, see if we can zoom in here a little bit. The power flag is red, but if I pull down on this, it goes back to gold. But if I unplug it, watch it change, it goes back to red. Oh, power is out. What are we going to do? Well, power comes back on, and then you pull it down again, and it goes back to gold. See? It does work. So let's go ahead and set this. It is about five minutes after one on a Friday turning this is no small feat. Those of us in 21st century that have the big old fingers. There's noon. There's 1.05. Well, we'll make it 1.06. Okay, so what are we going to do now? Well, we're going to set it here and we're going to let it run for a while. Oh, one of the things I should point out is if you listen really carefully, you don't hear anything. Why is that? That's because it's been serviced and now it works properly. No chunk, 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 chunk noise. So let me go ahead and move the camera. So I moved the camera. It is now approximately 1.7 and I'm going to let it run and run and run and I'm going to record it and I'm going to compare it to my watch that I'm wearing today which has the same time set on it and in a while I'll come back and uh, this part of the video I'll probably do like a time lapse thing and speed it way up until the very end so you don't have to sit here for a really long time but we'll let it run for a while and uh, see if it keeps good time.
It's been not quite an hour. And I hope you sat there and enjoyed watching the clock. Harvey enjoyed it. He's been sitting there mesmerized. He had a visitor come by and they chatted for a few minutes and then off he went. It's been almost an hour and if you compare it to my watch, if you can see that, it's a little hard to see. Here, we'll do it this way. We hold this up like this. They're both exactly the same time. Now, you know, not quite an hour is not much of a test and I will leave this plugged in and let it run for the next few days, but it seems to work well. There is no speed adjustment on something like this. It all has to do with how fast the Telecron gear drive assembly rotates, but it seems to be pretty accurate. The second hand moves nice and smoothly. It's not going chunk, 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 chunk as it moves, it just sweeps along, which is very nice. And I think it was successful. So I hope you found this interesting and perhaps for someone it will be helpful. If it is, give it a thumbs up because Harvey says you should. You know, he's kind of a slave driver. Do you know Harvey? Harvey is our shop mascot and he's also the executive producer of all of our YouTube videos. And he's kind of a slave driver. He likes to crack the whip and make sure we tow the line. There'll be a banner right here that shows you how to subscribe. Go to our YouTube homepage, click on the bell. And when you click on the bell, click on it to receive all notifications. And every time we post a new video, you'll get a notification and you can watch it. That's all for today. Keep an eye open for part four. See you on the next video.